Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Darius Means, and I'm the Executive Director for Rural and Community-Based Education, as well as an Associate Professor of Higher Education at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh campus in the School of Education. So the National Rural Education Association recently published the Why Rural Matters Report, a report that focuses on rural education across 50 states. And I'm thrilled that two of the authors of the report are here to speak with us today. So we have Dr. Daniel Showalter, who is an associate professor of mathematics at Eastern Mennonite University. And we also have Dr. Karen Epley, who's an associate professor of education at Penn State University. Dr. Showalter will uh, first provide context about the report and then take a closer look at what's happening in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. After that, Dr. Epley will respond uh, to the presentation by giving us a call to action for rural education. After the presentations, we will engage in Q&A. So if you do have questions, uh, please place your questions in the uh, Q&A um, throughout the presentations and I will facilitate the very end. So again, thank you for being here and Dr. Showalter, I will turn everything over to you. Thank you, Dr. Means. This is a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and I, I apologize, I should have on this slide also included my colleague, Dr. Karen Epley's name as well, because as Dr. Means said, she will be giving the uh, response to what I'm going to present here. And it's a, a true delight. Not only is she a co-author, but she is a resident, lifetime resident of Pennsylvania too. So adds a an extra bit of context here. So I'm going to talk with you about the release of Why Rural Matters 2023 uh, with the subtitle here, Centering Equity and Opportunity, and then go into some of the specifics that the report would, would focus on Pennsylvania. So this year's report um, is the first, or sorry, is, is the most recent in a line of 10 reports. The original Why Rural Matters uh, was conceptualized by the Rural School and Community Trust in 1999. So this has been going now for, for 24 years. And although it's changed in, in several ways, there are some constants that have been there for all, all of 10 reports. Purpose then and now has always been to provide a publicly accessible accounting of the context and conditions of rural education across the United States. Um, we, this year, for the first time, have been uh, partnered with the National Rural Education Association, and that's added some really neat um, benefits, opportunities that I'll talk, talk about today. The report is used widely. It's, that's another fun part of getting involved in this report. This is, I think, my fifth, maybe fifth uh, version that I've been involved with. But it's used by policymakers, practitioners, researchers, um, gets national media attention. Some of you may fall into one or more of those categories. Um, it, it just has a very wide reach because it is a nonpartisan accounting of the public data and tries to do so in a way that, that can be usable by a very large audience. And this particular 10th report that I'll be talking about is even more usable uh, because of some online website features that we've never had before. So I'll, I'll mention those tonight as well. Something else to note uh, about this particular report is we have some new indicators, and these are going to be related to well-being and equity. This was after a substantial amount of discussion, a, a lot of uh, stakeholders, and in light of the COVID pandemic. In fact, we have a, a special section specifically about the COVID pandemic, uh, the impact on rural America. And then we also have a second section on the NREA's rural research agenda. So this QR code you can use if you'd like to dig into the report or, or have access to it as uh, Dr. Epley and I speak, feel free to scan that. Um, you can also just do a uh, Google for why rural matters NREA and that that should come up as well if I click too fast for you to take a picture here. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about that second section, the rural research agenda. 
So the rural research agenda, and, and this QR code links to that agenda, by the way, this is a different QR code. The agenda was released in 2022, and it charts a path for rural education research for the next five years. The NREA Rural Research Agenda centers spatial and educational equity with five interconnected themes, which you can see here, policy and funding, teacher and school leader recruitment, retention and preparation, college and career trajectory, community partnerships and relationships, and health and wellness. The core category that you see in the center, spatial equity, is a term that captures the way opportunities aren't distributed equitably across plates. And that's kind of at the foundation, always has been at the foundation of this report. Spatial inequities impact the way resources are allocated and services and educational opportunities are distributed across places, including rural, suburban, urban, and town places. So although Why Rural Matters has always been a report about spatial equity, this year is the first that we have a gauge explicitly measuring access to supports, in part because we made an attempt to align with our report with this rural research agenda. So there's no shortage of data available on the web, good data, bad data, everything in between. We do maintain high standards for the data that we use. First, we only use publicly available data. And this is kind of an audit trail um, integrity type of issue. We wanna make sure that any of our results can be replicated, checked by anyone who's interested in doing so. Second, we only use data that can be disaggregated by locale so that we can separate out the rural areas from the rest. If Even if we have a really good variable, but we can't, pull apart the areas of the state that is rural versus the ones that are that are non-rural, then we don't use that in a report. So we have to have variables that have some measurement of the locale for that variable for, for that data set. And then of all the ones that pass those first two tests, we come together as a group and we try to pinpoint indicators that are most relevant to stakeholders, including all of you here, and to the health of rural education across the United States. We do have a strong team at NREA and elsewhere brainstorming which data points to use, but we're also open to exploring new areas. So please feel free to suggest ideas to, to either Dr. Epley or myself for upcoming reports. And you can uh, put that in the chat, by the way, at any point, and we'll get to, uh, we'll take a peek at those after Dr. Epley and I have presented. And several of our indicators in the past, by the way, have come out of a result of presentations just like this, where someone happens to say, hey, have you ever considered looking at this? And, and then we dig in and find out that there is a data set on that that, that meets our criteria. So please do be, be open about ideas that you have. For the current report, the five data sources that we used are shown here on the screen. The majority of our indicators come from the common core of data. EdFax has the graduation rates. The Office of Civil Rights has the data on gifted education. NAEP is the standardized testing data. And then Ed Data Express is a recent addition, just in the past couple of months, that houses data on multilingual learners. The rest of the data come through the American Community Survey, which is a smaller monthly data collection system that goes on in between the 10-year censuses by the, by the Census Bureau. So with all these data, it's important to talk about what we mean by rural. There's several different definitions of rural. And the vast majority of indicators in this report use the National Center for Education Statistics set of 12 locale codes. And of those 12 locale codes, three are rural. The rest are urban, suburban, and, and town. There are some adjustments being made to broaden the definition of rural, and that's already been decided, by the way. It, it should be rolling out in the next data set. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that during the question time tonight. But for this current report, this is where we're at, what you see on the screen. If you look at the, the two large uh, blue circles there, they define the populations for what's called an urban cluster, so a population of 2,500 to 50,000. And an urban area then would be larger than that. 
anything outside of this is considered rural. And there's different levels of rural depending on how far uh, a place would be located from one of those urban clusters or areas. So you can see the closest ones would be fringe, then distant, then remote. And I know this is very uh, theoretical definition based. I'm going to give you a picture of what that looks like for Pennsylvania here. Um, well, actually, right now, this, this next slide. So if you take a look, you can see First of all, focus in maybe on the cities. We're looking at pink areas. So Pittsburgh, of course, is a densely populated area. Um, I know some of you are, are from the Pittsburgh area. Philadelphia, but even smaller ones, you can see Allentown has some pink, Scranton, um, Reading, and Harrisonburg, Harrisburg would both also be considered different levels of urban areas. And then around every one of those urban areas, you can see some of these orange and yellow zones. These would be the suburban areas, uh, again, just based on density and, and closeness to those urban areas. And then if you look, it's a little harder to see outside throughout the state, you see these little blue clusters all over. These are the towns. That's that's where we're talking about 2,500 to to 50,000. Um, many of the towns aren't necessarily named here, but depending on if you're from Pennsylvania, you may see some little blue places and uh, recognize a, a name of the town there. And then the rest of the state, so what you see in various shades of green here, this is what's considered rural according to the National Center for Education Statistics. So any school that would be located in any of those green, whether it's dark, medium, or light green, that would be considered a rural school for the purposes of this report and also for the purposes of a lot of government funding and, and various other situations. So you can see that the great majority land-wise of Pennsylvania is considered rural. And in terms of population-wise, we'll take a, a peek at those numbers in just a second. Okay, so getting to the structure of the report, in all the recent versions of our report, we've maintained a fairly set structure. We start with five big picture gauges, and I'll mention those in just a second. Each one of these five gauges has five smaller indicators, and that gives us a total of 25 indicators, five, five indicators in each of five gauges. We then rank all the states with sufficient data on these indicators and gauges and provide all the related data summaries in a few visually appealing formats like maps and state pages. And then weave all this together in a story, a narrative, which is the main body of the report, followed by a couple of special interest topics unique to that report. So like I said before, in the current report, those topics would be the COVID-19 impact on rural areas and the NREA research agenda. And this particular report also contains a bonus indicator on multilingual learners in rural districts, and I'll mention more about that a bit later. So here's our five gauges. The first one is importance of rural education, and I would argue that rural education is important in every state. But this is more from the lens of uh, state level politicians, policymakers. We're talking, you know, what, what percent of the students in that state attend a rural school district, uh, what percent of the funding goes to rural areas, and, and similar types. We'll look at the specific indicators in just a second. But basically, how, how large of a presence does rural education have in that particular state? Second, we're looking at the diversity of rural students and their families, and this is racial, economic, we look at special education, um, geographic mobility, so how, how often uh, people are changing residences, students are changing residences. Uh, this is certainly a, um, a benefit in many ways to have these levels of diversity and also challenges, poses challenges uh, in terms of resources and, and how that integration takes place. Educational policy that has impacted rural schools and communities. The outcomes, so these would be the, the standardized testing data as well as the graduation rates. And then our newest gauge, that access to supports for learning uh, and development of students in rural schools. So this one would, would include things like health insurance, public preschool, 
a gifted ratio, uh, male, male, female, and a couple other things, a wireless internet access, and uh, we'll, we'll get into the specifics for Pennsylvania here again fairly soon. So let me talk briefly about how our ranking system works because it can be a little confusing at first. So after we get all the data for the rural areas of every state, we then rank the states on the data. And it's not the typical kind of competition where first place is a good thing. It's not necessarily where you want to, it's not necessarily a bad thing either. First place just means for whatever reason, this is a state that we should really be paying close attention to on this particular indicator. So you can think of it like a flashing red light for policymakers, other stakeholders. Here we're, here's where we want to draw your attention. It's a way to help prioritize limited resources. And it can also be used within a given state to see where some additional attention might be needed. We'll see that for Pennsylvania here very soon. So even though some states have higher overall prior priority needs, every state in the US has areas where they can be working on for improving the health of rural education in that state. So I'm gonna start with national findings and then zoom in on Pennsylvania specifically. At the national level, the first point that I wanna bring out is under the health and wellness umbrella. So on average, one school psychologist or guidance counselor serves 310 students in rural schools. So one for every 310. And this is an example of how widely access to services varies state to state because some, some states have ratios of more than 400 to one. So over 400 students for a single uh, psychologist or guidance counselor on average. And other states like New Hampshire, for example, has a ratio of 149 to one, which arguably could still be improved upon but is a much different situation than, than states like Michigan, where, where you have a great disparity uh, for those guidance counselors and psychologists. Second, not surprisingly, we did find a strong correlation between access to supports for learning and development with poor educational outcomes. States that need to pay more attention to learning and development to those, those resources, those supports, also tend to have lower learning outcomes. And even though we don't have a direct way to show causality here, these two measures definitely go hand in hand correlationally. Finally, the report also found that while white students are overrepresented in rural gifted and talented programming, even though there was a fairly good um, male-female balance in gifted programming, uh, the racial inequities were not, not so uh, promising. There was 17% of students in rural schools identify as Hispanic or Latinx. Those students made on, up only 9% of students in the, the rural districts. And similarly, 10% of rural students identify as Black, but Black children make up only 5% of those receiving gifted programming. A uh, few more findings. We know that rural schools offset some of the impacts of poverty. This is one of the assets of living in rural areas, and, and that's been shown in, in several studies. Although in every state, rural students from homes with incomes below the poverty line scored lower on the NAEP in both reading and math than students who don't. So if you take the rural students within a state, separate out the um, the ones who are living in poverty and the students who are not living in poverty, the ones who are not living in poverty always, in all 50 states, those rural students on average scored better than their peers who were living in poverty. But the difference is um, we're very small in some states between the two groups, so the students of poverty and students not living in poverty. And in other groups, there was a, in other states, there was a very wide spread between those two. Another point to mention that COVID made clear that adequate internet connectivity is an issue of equity. More than 13% of rural households lack even minimum broadband. Uh, 
And in six states, that percentage is over 16%, which would be more than one in six rural households lacking that basic internet access. Finally, in the majority of states, rural students graduate from high school at rates higher than their non-rural peers. And there were exceptions. In two states, Arizona and Alaska, the rural graduation rates was more than three percentage points lower than the non-rural graduation rate. Uh, even though this does appear small, in Alaska, for example, if rural students had graduated at the same rate as non-rural students, we would have seen an additional 200 to 250 students graduating from rural high school. Now, the, the situation in Pennsylvania is very different than it is in Alaska, and it's the opposite. The rural students in Pennsylvania are graduating at a higher rate, and we'll, we'll take a peek at it. Okay, so let's let's take a look. Uh, most of you are very connected with Pennsylvania, either either living in Pennsylvania or for whatever reason are closely aligned with Pennsylvania. So let's let's see how Pennsylvania fared on these twenty five indicators. So this is that first gauge, which talks about rural presence. How how prominent is the rural presence within a state? And you can see on many of these. Remember the. The higher the number of the rank, like the 30s, the 40s, these are ones that aren't necessarily um, rising to prominence compared to other states. So if we look at these really quickly, the one indicator that jumps out immediate, immediately at me for Pennsylvania is the number of rural students. Pennsylvania has a lot of rural students, uh, over a quarter million rural students, 255,000. This is the seventh highest in the U.S. There's only six states in the U.S. that have more rural students than Pennsylvania. Now, what happens in Pennsylvania, because you also have some very large urban areas in terms of actual percentage, you can see that 16.9% uh, of students would be attending school in a rural district. So even though there's a, a very large number of rural students, sometimes they can get drowned there in just the, the massive amounts of students who are in the urban areas in, in Pennsylvania as well. In terms of diversity, you'll notice that in general, Pennsylvania is not one of the more diverse rural states. For example, um, this diversity index, what, what this means is a, a little hard, but let, I, I can uh, give a real quick explanation here. If you were to take uh, a random rural school in Pennsylvania and just pluck two students out at random, randomly choose any two students in, in that school, what's the chance that those two students would identify as a different race or ethnicity from each other? Well, in Pennsylvania, that number is 20%. You'd, you'd have about a one in five chance that those two students would be of a different race or ethnicity. And, and four in five, 80% ch chance that they would be the same race or ethnicity. So this is one of the least racially diverse, ethnically diverse states in the U.S. in terms of the rural areas. That's, that's what that rank of 37 means. Uh, similarly, the poverty levels uh, whether you look at the income level, household incomes of the school communities, or just at the percent of rural children who are living under the poverty line, either way you look at it, Pennsylvania um, fares much better than most of the states in the U.S., although there's some nuances, and I think Dr. Epley will mention uh, at least one or two of those nuances to consider for Pennsylvania specifically. Uh, and then mobility, there's not a lot of movement between residences relative to rural areas in other states. But uh, one thing we do see here is the number one. So in the entire U.S., Pennsylvania has a higher percent of their rural students being identified for an IEP uh, of, of any state in the U.S. So one in five, one in five students in Pennsylvania, rural students has an IEP. And that, you know, that's that has pros and cons. It's not necessarily a good or bad thing. It's something to be aware of because that's going to um, consume resources and something to be in the attention of policymakers. When we look at policy itself, we kind of have a mixed thing in terms of the finances, the pure finances, such as how much schools are spending per pupil. 
and how much teachers are getting paid. Pennsylvania is doing well in both of those areas. Uh, in the other ones, though, in terms of how much of a burden transportation is taking on the rural budget in Pennsylvania, rural district budgets, that's a lot, 11th, one of the 11th highest uh, that they have to spend on transportation relative to what they get to spend on instruction. The median organizational scale. So what this is, is a measure of how big the schools and districts are. It's often kind of a measure of consolidation that's taken place. But in general, Pennsylvania has very large schools and districts. Uh, and there are some, some policy consequences that are attached to that. And then the state revenue, uh, I think Dr. Epley will mention this also, but Pennsylvania makes the districts rely heavily on local tax bases instead of money coming in from the state, which can lead to inequities since certain areas will generate a much higher tax base than others. Uh, outcomes, so these are the educational standardized testing graduation rate. Pennsylvania was pretty near the center on all of these. I'm not sure I'll go into details now. If there's questions later, feel free to ask. I did want to point out that rural advantage there, that 3.9%. What that's saying is that students who enter a rural high school in Pennsylvania are 3.9 percentage points more likely to graduate than your average student entering a non-rural school in Pennsylvania. And, and non-rural includes all the urban areas, but also all the suburban areas, all the town, all of those combined. If you think of that map, uh, the green areas versus the non-green areas. The green areas are graduating at, at a much higher rate. I would say that's a, a fairly substantial difference compared to the non-rural. And I think that's an asset of rural areas, of, of especially of whatever is going on in Pennsylvania rural areas. Uh, that's noteworthy right there. Finally, um, we have the access to support. So this is our newest gauge. All of these would be new indicators that we've never measured before. Um, Pennsylvania, there's several areas here which could probably stand some improvement. The first one being the percent of rural school-aged children without health insurance. So almost 10%, almost one in 10 students in rural areas do not have basic health insurance. And that's, that's one of the highest percentages in the US there. Uh, we also see that Pennsylvania has pretty low enrollment in public preschool. Um, the, it's one of the few states where the gifted programs are identifying more males than females. And my guess is, I don't know the specific numbers for Pennsylvania, my guess is that disparity is even stronger in the math area, because that's a national trend where females don't tend to be identified as much uh, for math gifted programs. So if you already have an inequity in the general gifted program, my guess is that would probably be even worse in the, the math area. And then we have that internet access, uh, again, rural areas in Pennsylvania having a very low uh, level of internet access. One thing that Pennsylvania is relative, this is relative, but the access to mental health or guidance counseling is fairly good in Pennsylvania. There's a ratio of 263 students for each psychologist, school counselor. Again, I think that could be even better with more school counselors and psychologists, but relative to other states, rural Pennsylvania has a fairly good situation right now. Overall, Pennsylvania, uh, I won't focus on this too much, but this is the average when we put all five gauges together, um, so combine essentially all 25 indicators, Mississippi here, Arizona, Alabama, these would be the most urgent states and, and Pennsylvania is quite a bit down that list there. Okay, I mentioned the multilingual learners. This was something that just came um, in the past couple months. So one of the fastest growing populations in rural areas is the multilingual learner population. Um, not only have the absolute numbers been increasing over the past decade, but they're also increasing as a percentage of overall rural student population. And because of some shifts in data reporting standards and where data were housed, we only found reliable data on multilingual learners after our initial report was released in November. So our current one, the one that we 
linked you to today now includes a follow-up section that does show the percentage of rural students in each state who are multilingual learners. And here you can see for Pennsylvania, it's not a, a huge portion. It's it's about 1%, so one, one in 100, which is uh, on par with Ohio, a bit more than West Virginia, uh, but almost about half of what, what we would see in rural New York. And sometimes, I mean, this can have a double meaning. If, if there's not a lot in, in one sense, you might think, oh, it's not as important then. But oftentimes, the smaller that percent, the more the opportunity that they could be marginalized, could not be getting the resources they need. So I would argue that that's also something to pay very close attention to, that that 1% is getting the, the help support that they need. Um, I'd like to review some of the resources that accompany this report uh, to aid in its application and use. This is a data dashboard, first time we've ever had this. Users can select a state or multiple states by typing in the search box on the top right or clicking on the map. The right side column displays the rankings for five key gauges that I mentioned and all the indicators. And the left side displays values for all the gauges and indicators for the selected state or states. If you want to download the data, if you click on the link in the bottom left, this down, down arrow, then you can do any kind of spreadsheety stuff that you want with, with that data. I would like to acknowledge Charlie Mix, Director of Geographic Information Systems at UT Chattanooga. He was the one who developed this data dashboard, which really is a, a fantastic resource. We also have a communications toolkit, again, for the first time. And this has several resources to aid report users, such as yourself, stakeholders, everything you would need to communicate with varied constituencies, including a report summary and highlights, FAQs, materials for producing your own state-specific communications, uh, graphics, a news release template with background info and national results. You would just put in Pennsylvania or whatever state you want to emphasize. And then a PowerPoint slide deck, uh, again, with the background info and national results included. And I'll give just a couple examples of what that, uh, that communications toolkit would look like there. There is a link. Um, Dr. Means, I'm I'm guessing this PowerPoint could be made available to the audience. Is that correct? That's correct. I, I'm happy to do that. Awesome. So I won't I won't uh, linger too too long here. Uh, again, this is where you could find the report itself, the data dashboard, and basically everything that I've been talking about. You could find there. I think there's a link there that also gives the research agenda, which was the one thing that that wouldn't be here. And then Alan Pratt has information. You can also contact me or Dr. Epley as well with any kind of specific questions. So uh, Dr. Means, I think I'll turn it over to you if you want to introduce Dr. Epley. Yeah, so Dr. Showalter, um, thank you so much for the presentation. And so next we're gonna have Dr. Uh, Karen Epley uh, sort of give a, a call to action um, in a response to thinking about some of the key data and what it means for Pennsylvania. But after that, we'll do Q&A. So if you do have questions, um, don't hesitate to place your questions in the Q&A, and I will uh, facilitate that. Uh, so Dr. Epley, I'll turn everything over to you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Karen Epley. I'm a graduate of Bald Eagle Area School District in Center County. Some of you might know that district. All three of my degrees are from Penn State, and I've been researching and publishing rural education research for 15 years. I prepare teachers at Penn State, and I'm just deeply committed to rural schools in Pennsylvania and nationally. I live in rural Pennsylvania still today, less than 10 miles from where I grew up, and all three of my children attended the same K-12 rural school that I did. So I'm representing Pennsylvania with you today. But I share this to testify to the fact that rural Pennsylvania schools have incredible potential and verified successes in preparing children for higher education and living wage jobs. And as a lifelong rural Pennsylvanian, when I listen to the data that Dr. Showalter presented, a few things jump out at me, and I return to a few statistics that he shared earlier as well. The first is the large number of rural students that we have in Pennsylvania. Now, I know he said this, but I think it's worth repeating that we have more than a quarter million rural students 
Only six states have more, but because of large numbers of non-rural communities, specifically around Pittsburgh and Philly, rural students make up just under 17% of the total number of students in the state. So this places us at a really huge disadvantage politically as compared to other states such as Vermont, Mississippi, Maine, where rural students make up about half the total students in the state. So with low percentages of rural students, rural needs are often not forefront in the minds of lawmakers in the ways that they might be in states with higher percentages of rural students. Here are three findings across two separate indicators that interact and compound that 88 cent figure, right? That low state revenue to local dollar funding. So in Pennsylvania, rural schools are over-reliant on their local tax bases. Only 13 states rely more on local funding. And this is hugely impactful for those rural schools that have very high community poverty levels, something that a state wide average can't get at very well. So for example, we know that poverty rates vary dramatically from one district to the next. For example, the poverty rate in communities with fracking will look very different compared to those without. And I'll re revisit the next two statistics as well. Children with IEPs and transportation expenses in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, not only is the ratio of state to local funding problematic, but rural schools are also absorbing very high special education and transportation costs. So while state to local funding ranks 18th, the state has high demands on those dollars for transportation and special education. A third demand on Pennsylvania rural school budgets that compounds that ratio between local and state funding even further is cyber charter tuition. Why Rural Matters doesn't report on cyber charter or brick and mortar charter expenditures because not all states allow charter schools, and this is a national report, but at 60,000 students, no state has more cyber charter students. So the impact of cyber charter tuition has been devastating for small rural school budgets. And again, along with special education and transportation is a unique demand on rural schools. But you can see this for yourself for your own district. This is an interactive map that was created in connection to the school funding lawsuit. You can link to it from the QR code there on the screen. But you can see even without linking that rural schools in Pennsylvania are not operating on an equal playing field, even within the state, let alone compared to other states that don't share some of the challenges that we see in Pennsylvania. Last slide, there it is. Finally, one more financial situation to keep in mind is the end of COVID-19 emergency funding coming this September. So the impact of that funding cliff will depend on how individual districts spent that money to start with. So districts who were able to avoid spending money on recurring costs and could use the funds for one-time costs, such as facility upgrades, will be better off than those who had to spend on staffing. You can click to both piece, pieces from their QR codes. And I think I'll leave it at that and we'll turn it back over to Dr. Means for some Q&A. Dr. Epley, thank you so much. So again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to place your questions in a Q&A um, or you're welcome to put it in the chat. I'm happy to uh, facilitate, but I'll kick us off with the first uh, question. So based on the data in the report, um, what would you say are some important resources and assets in rural Pennsylvania that you believe other states could learn from Pennsylvania? I know sometimes we're so focused on what's not working, what are the deficits, but what could other folks learn from Pennsylvania based on um, the key findings from your report or your own research? Yeah, I, I could take that for a minute, Dr. Means. I think just to return to that rural graduation rate advantage that Dr. Showalter mentioned before, 3.9%, that's 766 students approximately, right, who graduated from rural schools that statistically would not have graduated if they had attended non-rural schools. So I think um, one of the opportunities that this report presents to users 
is the opportunity to say, okay, so we know that Pennsylvania is doing exceptionally well with rural school graduation. What is it that's happening, right? What other data can we link to? What other qualitative data can we gather to find out the why behind what's going on with this success in the state? So I would invite you to think through that. You know, you might wonder, well, why? Why are students graduating um, at higher rates in Pennsylvania, right? That's that's where we need to go next with this research. I'll, I'll also add to that. Um, I think that that was wonderfully said, and and probably I would have jumped to that same thing, um, Dr. Epley, the, the graduation rate. Um, this report, because it's at such a large level, you know, national, but also state state level, um, can be a very good starting place for discussion and explorations and maybe some things align with what you might expect and some things are surprising like, oh, I, I thought Pennsylvania would be very different in that, that situation. Um, so this is where we turn it over to the experts in, you know, whatever your respective field is or whatever your area is so that you can then bring your, your knowledge, your expertise and dive in deeper to the specifics. And just to give a real quick example of, of what that would look like, um, if, if we take the graduation rate, one thing I could do, and I'm happy to do this if you you contact me, I can, I can set you up with this, but I could look district by district across Pennsylvania, where are the specific rural districts that really had the highest graduation rates and then you could even, I mean, I've done things just like cold calls to the superintendents, like, hey, I just noticed this uh, data anomaly, and I'm just curious if what kind of initiatives you've been doing, because at that point, it's a matter of trying to dig into the stories, like the statistics are a good starting place, um, and they show you like where to focus your, your limited attention, but once you've got a focus, you really need to, to dive into some of that qualitative, some of those stories to find out what's going on and why why we're seeing Pennsylvania have those kind of numbers. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So I have a question here. Um, so do any of these data include students who identify as native, uh, living on sovereign land within each of these states uh, whose data are reported here? That That's a great question. And that's one that we have, we have considered recently of going a deeper dive into. So the way the way it works, and I don't think Dr. Epley or I are necessarily the, the experts. We do have someone on our team who works very closely with native populations, uh, attends the national conferences in for rural areas. And one thing I, I've heard them say is that um, it the data really depends on uh, the specific tribe, the specific location. Some are reported. I know for sure that some are in this data set, and I also know for sure that some are not in this data set. So because of that, it's hard to get a clear and accurate picture of some of these native groups. Um, so considering we've been, we've been playing, it's just hard because data is handled so differently in every situation. So to come up with a, a coherent, consistent report on those areas um, throughout throughout um, the US would be very valuable. And we've struggled with some of the data consistency there, but it is something we're we're looking into. It's That's a wonderful, and that's something that someone who was more of an expert could take this. I could give you some starting points and then you could take it and run with it using your knowledge of those, those populations. I would just say that we would love your ideas on how to get more consistent data. This particular, um, this particular statistic missing from our report has kind of been a little bit of a burr for me as well. Um, we just we need the data to be there, um, and we welcome your ideas on how we can get correct and consistent data into the report. So I'm happy to ask another uh, question. Uh, so we know the racial, ethnic, language diversity is increasing in rural Pennsylvania. And what would you say are some important considerations for educators and also policymakers as we think about this increasing diversity? 
Um, that's that's a great question, and and it's hard, I think, to give a a blanket answer because that looks so different in in different districts. Um, I personally, when I see that indicator, we we used to have a very different way of measuring racial diversity that I I wasn't happy with. It was very overly simplistic. Um, I really like this because it's a measure of of integration and. I think it's somewhat in a way that can be celebrated a, a bit more. So, for example, this is one of the cases where I did those cold calls with the last report. Um, I looked across, there's 14,000 school districts in the United States, and I, I sorted by the diversity index so I could get the 10, I think maybe 20 most diverse uh, school districts in the U.S. And then I wrote to each of those superintendents or representatives from each of those those 20 districts to hear some of the stories and it was beautiful they would send pictures and and ways that they're they would talk about some of the challenges but they would also send pictures of you know cultural diversity day or this is a mentoring interracial mentoring program we have or this is um whatever kind of initiatives they had going on and, and that was that was encouraging to hear some some of those stories I could just tag on just to circle back to the ratio between local and state funding and how that impacts the extent to which rural schools can afford appropriate and necessary supports for small numbers of rural multilingual learners. So I think that's just, you know, um, a story that we just have to keep on saying over and over again, right, that that um, the ratio of local to state funding is going to be very impactful to a variety um, of services that we can provide, but certainly the service of multilingual learners in rural places is one of them when um, you know superintendents have to make hard decisions about which faculty to hire, right? In, in those smaller numbers, right? That makes that decision perhaps more difficult when there should be money to serve all children. Thank you both. Um, there's a follow up question about is this about is it increase in racial diversity, ethnic diversity, disability, uh, ESOL or other. And so I am putting a link in here to the Center for Rural Pennsylvania that does talk about some of these uh, stats around at least uh, increase in racial and ethnic diversity. But I don't know for uh, Dr. Showalter and Dr. Epley if you all can comment on anything that you've seen in Pennsylvania in terms of increasing um, diversity or increasing um, uh, numbers of students who may um, have an IEP um, based on previous uh, data collection. Dan, you, you are our uh, Why Rural Matters yeah. historian. So I will- I'd, I'd have to, it's a great that. question. Um, and I, I could do that fairly easily, go back to previous reports. Uh, if you Google Why Rural Matters, you'll be able to see the different reports across the years. And in fact, I think it was about two reports ago where one of the gauges we did was a longitudinal gauge. So we, right now, we're just giving a snapshot of what it looks like right now. But that that particular report, we did look across time. So we focused on the changes, the increases, the decreases. Um, so looking at Pennsylvania and how it fared on that gauge uh, two reports ago would be a good way to start into that question. I'm pretty certain that the IEP uh, rate is not new. I don't know if it was number one last report, but um, Pennsylvania, you know, in the recent past has had very high numbers of students identify for special education. But any more questions from anyone? I'm seeing comments that this was um, very helpful and very crucial work. So thank you. And if, if I were a rural researcher in Mississippi, um, I would be citing this report for every grant I write. I mean, this and and citing it across the years too because mississippi is consistently in the top one two or three every no matter what how we measure it no matter how we look at it yeah there's a lot of 
a lot of room for that. Maybe I'll end with this question here. So there's a question about in the uh, 1819 Why Rural Matters Report, the college readiness gauge provided information about AP exam rate. And is that present in this current report? Yeah, that's a good question. So that was that was kind of our focal area for that report was college readiness. And that was one of the indicators we looked at. So that would not be in this report. However, if you wanted to see where Pennsylvania was was doing right now or rural Pennsylvania was doing in, in those AP exam rate participation, that would be the civil rights data collection. Uh, if you Google civil rights data collection, you can even, it, it's a pretty usable website. You can even type in specific school districts and see, see the stats on things like AP exam rate, bullying, harassment. It has a lot of really interesting data that you don't necessarily get in, in some of the big data sets usually. So I want to say uh, a thank you to Dr. Showalter and Dr. Epley uh, for joining us today for this webinar. I also want to say a thank you to the School of Education at the University of Pittsburgh for the sub uh, financial support for today's webinar. And many thanks to the people behind the scenes who made this webinar happen, including Rachel Stowe, as well as the marketing and communications team in the School of Education. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And the plan is to um, provide information about the webinar uh, pretty soon uh, so you can see that recording. Um, and if you ever have questions or are interested in learning more about um, rural and community-based initiatives at the University of Pittsburgh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you.